Welcome to White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod. Delivered in short doses, this mini podcast features informal, on topic discussions with in house experts, outside counsel, and other thought leaders on a wide array of cutting edge and practical white collar and compliance topics. Visit PerkinsCooey.com for more information on our nationally ranked white collar and investigations practice. On this episode of White Collar Briefly, the University of Colorado's Interim Executive Vice Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer, Patrick O'Rourke, discusses the reality of higher education in the age of COVID-19, as well as some of his most memorable matters, including the investigation of Aurora theater shooter James Holmes and the trial involving former Colorado professor Ward Churchill. O'Rourke also provides helpful tips for attorneys seeking to succeed in a higher education in-house position. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Perkins Cooey LLP and should not be considered legal advice. Welcome to this episode of White Collar Briefly. I'm your host for today, Gina LaMonica. Today we have as our guest, Patrick O'Rourke former GC and interim COO at the University of Colorado, Boulder. And also with us is my partner and co-host, Marcus Funk. Pat, great to have you. And I think you're our first higher ed in-house counsel that we've had on our show. So we're doubly excited because we can ask you about all the secrets of what's going on at, in higher ed right now. Fair enough, but I'm not in-house counsel anymore. They took me out of my lawyer job. <laughs> That's right, COO. Well, tell us a little bit about how your career has changed since you have abdicated the general counsel throne and are now the chief operating officer for the University of Colorado. So I think the biggest difference is that when I was in the legal counsel role, you're doing a lot of the advising and other people are tasked with the ultimate decision making. Switching over to the COO role that I have now, I'm actually responsible for making a lot of the decisions. So it's a shift in mindset from being one where you're trying to help a client think through the implications of a decision to where now I'm relying upon others to help me think through the implications of the decisions that ultimately land on my desk. And you took that position, I guess you were appointed by the chancellor in January and and, and took over in February, so your timing was impeccable? Yeah, it was fantastic. And so I eased into the job, and then three weeks later, the COVID crisis hit, and we were faced with the question of what to do with our campus community ultimately had to reach the decision that it wasn't the right thing to do to keep our students in the dormitories and on campus and our faculty transitioned over to teaching remotely in the matter of a couple of days. You know, prior to your current role as the chief operating officer, you were in the role of general counsel to the university and secretary to the board for many years. And I thought it would be helpful to kind of go over your background and talk about what steps you took in your pathways to get where you are today. So taking us back through, it sounds like, you know, you had a lot of experience at the university even before you became the general counsel. Yeah, so my career path was that I graduated from law school and I didn't know what I was going to be doing for a job like a lot of law students did. But I grew up in Colorado and I got a job where I was working for insurance defense firm that did a bunch of litigation. And that was actually really valuable because I got some courtroom time and actually got to see how cases played out. One of our in-house clients was the university And they were going through a patch of litigation involving Title IX, an issue involving one of our faculty members named Ward Churchill. And the guy who was the general counsel back then, Charlie Sweet, recruited me in to be in charge of the university's in-house litigation. And I was able to do that for about five years. And we're different than a lot of other institutions in that we handled litigation internally and only hired outside counsel under abnormal circumstances. And so I got a chance to try some really interesting cases, and it gave me a lot of familiarity with the entire university system because the cases would come off of all the campuses and they would involve faculty, they'd involve students, they'd involve staff, they'd involve constitutional issues. And so when the general counsel retired, I was in a position to be able to transfer what I had learned from doing the litigation into being able to advise more broadly and 
have the university lawyers reporting to me. And I was really lucky that I had a great in-house team of lawyers who handled 90% of the day-to-day legal work and did it way better than I ever could. Um, And then my job was really just to try to help make sure that we were on the same page and helping the leadership make the decisions that rose up to their level. And what I found interesting about your background in particular is the mention of all the trial experience that you have had. And you were in private practice for about 10 years and then transitioning into your role with litigation with the university, you know, another good chunk of time. And seeing you in the press releases transferring from being general counsel in that role over to chief operating officer, one thing that struck me is reading again and again about your litigation experience. And I was wondering whether you feel like you got more experience in private practice in a decade worth of practice or uniquely, perhaps, since you've moved into the university role, if you had more experience in courtroom trials, et cetera, in your time at the university. So I think the amount of courtroom time I got was roughly equivalent. Like anybody else who was litigating, you had some cases that went to trial, you had some cases that settled. The real difference was when I was in private practice, you got to see a whole lot of different businesses, different clients, how they approached their decisions in many different ways. And you got a lot of exposure to how people would do things differently, which was valuable to when you went in in in-house then you become really enmeshed in your particular client's culture. But you also then bring in what you have learned from litigating for other people as well. And so it was really a nice way to be able to blend the breadth of private practice with the depth of really understanding a particular client. I had a false belief when I came in because I'd been doing outside litigation for the university for a number of years that when I came in, I thought, I know kind of how the place works. And what you find out is that when you're outside counsel, you don't really have the same type of insider's perspective that you think you do. And that when you get really immersed in the day-to-day decision-making, you have a better understanding of what are the issues and the impact of how litigation really filters through the whole business. That raises another question I had, which is, you know, a big part of practicing in law is client satisfaction. And just wondering, you know, you've worn a lot of different hats throughout your career. How have you tried to thread that needle of outside counsel, inside counsel, and answering to many masters, probably on both ends of that spectrum? But in terms of client service, client satisfaction, what have you taken away as the important parts of that aspect of practicing law? I think it helped me coming into an in-house role to have been outside counsel because you really do have to approach it from client service perspective. There are people who have either been in public service or in-house that haven't had to deal with the demands of having multiple clients, having the same number of constituents that you have in outside practice and bringing the, the client service perspective into an in-house role. I think the constituents appreciate it. With our in-house legal office, we actually did surveys of our critical constituents and treated them like they were clients rather than just treating the whole organization as a client. And you might find that the HR department on the Boulder campus thinks you're doing a great job where the people who are working in treasury might think you're not doing so well. And just like you want to get feedback from your clients in private practice, you want to get in-house counsel as well, because ultimately you're not sending out monthly bills to those folks, but you are going to them and saying, listen, I need to hire a lawyer or here's something that I think we need to do. And if they're not happy with the quality of the service that you're giving them, then they're probably not going to support your operation. So you need to be just as attentive to your constituent demands in in in-house as you were in private practice, with one exception, which is that when you're in private practice, you really have to be responsive to all of your constituents. What you do have in-house is you have some decision makers at the top where if you've got competing demands, you can really go to them and say, how do we prioritize the demands right now and which ones are most important in a way that you can't do as much when you're in private practice? 
you know, I was going to ask you about the James Holmes case, which I think our listeners will be really interested in hearing about. And I think your experience in private practice and your sort of in the trenches sensitivities came into play in that case. But you mentioned Ward Churchill. And that's another case that you personally actually handled, which, as you said, is, is pretty unusual for folks who are in-house in a higher ed uh, capacity. Could you tell our listeners a little bit about what the Ward Churchill case was involved? Sure. It's now becoming ancient history, but it really dealt with a situation where Professor Churchill had made some inflammatory comments after 9-11 where he compared the people who worked in the Trade Center to Adolf Eichmann, really the architect of a lot of the Nazi functions. And when he did, that brought him under a whole lot of public scrutiny. Ultimately, the university made a decision that was a correct one, that Professor Churchill's speech itself was protected by the First Amendment. During the course of that whole controversy, some people came forward and said that Churchill had engaged in acts of fabrication, falsification, plagiarism. And so there was an internal investigation to look at that and to reach a determination by some of our faculty groups that he had engaged in that type of misconduct for which our governing board dismissed Professor Churchill. He then sued and claimed that the discharge was pretextual and that really all tied back to the First Amendment issues. The hard part was explaining that, yes, although it was the First Amendment protected speech that brought him into the public eye, we still had an obligation to be able to investigate misconduct that brought it to our attention. That case went to trial, and a jury initially awarded Professor Churchill a dollar. The judge then determined that the university was entitled to judgment as a matter of law, and that decision was upheld through the Colorado Supreme Court with the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately denying certiorari and establishing the principle that universities have an obligation to be able to investigate misconduct when it occurs and that the fact that there was protected speech that may have given rise to the need to investigate doesn't mean that you are prohibited from investigating. Since we're practitioners and most of our listeners are practitioners, is there any anecdote, anything you remember about the case that was sort of particularly unusual that you can share? The most interesting thing, it was very active news at the time. And I had the weird experience of that the trial was being broadcast daily, as well as that there were two different websites that were live blogging the trial. And the most interesting piece to me was people were saying, don't pay attention to the media, but it was like having an extra juror in the courtroom And that if you would look at the live blogging and they were saying, this person testified, but we didn't really understand what they were trying to get out of them, or that something really fell flat, it was getting the perception of other people who weren't on your team, who were always telling you, wow, you're doing great, that getting that impartial feedback. And after that, I actually thought it was important to have impartial observers who were just kind of watching the trial and who weren't part of the trial team to be able to provide feedback on what was landing and what wasn't, that I never would have figured that out unless I had been through an experience where I was getting live blogged and some people were telling me, yeah, this really worked. And other people were telling me that really sucked. And understanding that people who are really immersed in the case tend to lose sight of the big themes. In your career at Colorado, you've covered a lot of important, a lot of high profile, a lot of sensitive, in some cases, all of the three cases, investigations, matters. The other one that I thought our listeners would be particularly interested in hearing a little more about is the tragic case of James Holmes, tragic for his victims. I was hoping you could, just by way of a refresher, for those who may not remember or not as familiar with the James Holmes matter, maybe you can, again, give us a a summary of what the James Holmes investigation involved, how it came about, and then also reflect a little bit on what you're looking for when it comes to investigations and investigators. Yeah, happy to. The James Holmes was the Aurora Theater shooting where... Mr. Holmes went into a showing of a Batman movie and tragically took the lives of many people while he was heavily armed with assault weapons and body armor. And immediately after that, it came to light that he had been 
a student in one of our PhD programs as well as an employee in the sense that he was paid for research that he was conducting. And that gave rise to questions of what was the university's knowledge about his propensity for dangerousness. And none of this is privileged because it all came out in his criminal trial. He had mailed a notebook that discussed some of his plans to his psychiatrist, a woman named Lynn Fenton, who received the notebook tragically after the shooting itself happened. And so there were questions about what did the university know and when. In that type of situation, we're a public institution and it's important for us to be accountable. And so rather than doing an in-house investigation where I think that people are inherently distrustful. It was important for us to bring in people who had knowledge and expertise. And so we contacted Perkins Coie in large part because of the work that Bob Miller had done as the U.S. attorney to be able to come in and look at a number of critical questions, including how was the medical care that he had received provided? What was the nature of his admissions process? And was there any reason to believe that we had not adequately responded to potential threats? threats within our community. And it really is important, not just from the standpoint of accountability, but also to be able to make sure that your building systems that are well designed to be able to protect your community within the university, as well as the broader community, that we had that type of engagement and worked forward to be able to really address it. And as you saw from Dr. Fenton's testimony during the course of the trial, there were reasons why she was concerned about James Holmes but that there were also really tight restrictions about when a psychiatrist is allowed to be able to disclose those concerns to members of the public. And it really does open up a broader conversation about the value of having privilege for medical professionals versus the ability to disclose information when there's a threat of public harm. In James Holmes's case, Nothing he ever said met that threshold, but it raises important questions about societally, where do we want to be in terms of being able to protect the public versus encouraging people to seek mental health treatment. So it was a fascinating experience, but one that I don't think there's ever going to be any perfect answers for. And you know, that issue of weighing privilege and frankly, litigation advantage or not creating a disadvantage in litigation weighing those interests against the interest of transparency, particularly for a public institution, must have been exceptionally difficult and one that probably involved a lot of stakeholders. And if you don't want to talk about the specifics of James Holmes, that's totally fine. But maybe you can give us a general sense of, you know, how does a public institution, how do you in in the role that you had in the legal department of a public institution, how do you decide where that balance should tip? So, Part of it is not in our hands. If there's information, and we found this in Holmes' case, which are either protected by medical privileges or are protected by FERPA, which is the privilege that attaches to student records, we have to be very careful to respect that. And that's why I've only talked here about things that were discussed during the criminal trial rather than things that remain privileged. There's still medical records for James Holmes that are privileged. There's still FERPA records for James Holmes that remain privileged, and we have to respect that. And so part of what we have to do in these type of investigations is make sure that we're honoring what we need to honor, but also letting our communities know that we're going to be transparent where we can be transparent If we can't release some information, we're going to tell you why we can't release it, and we're going to explain to you what we're doing in a way that allows you to know that we're taking the steps that are necessary in order to make sure our community is safe. But balancing those privacy concerns and fully respecting that even someone like James Holmes has a right to privacy where that's been created by federal or state law. That's something we have to respect, even though other people don't always understand our need to respect it. And you mentioned, Pat, selecting your investigator based in part on, in this case, his background. And we're talking about Bob Miller, who is really a giant of the legal profession in Colorado. And I say that with some bias because he's a former colleague of ours. 
when you're looking to hire outside counsel as a general rule, what guides you? I mean, James Holmes is a specific case where unimpeachability and, and sort of that credibility matters a great deal. But for other cases that may not be as high profile, how do you decide what firm to hire for what matter? And again, I'm bringing you back to your GC days and a little bit out of your COO days. That's okay. I spent a lot more time as a GC. So I think when you're looking at an outside investigation, the first thing you have to decide is, do we need to hire somebody? And the reasons that you hire outside people for some investigations versus others, number one is you could have a conflict where you don't think it's appropriate to have your internal people doing it. Number two is you could have a situation where you don't have the internal resources to be able to do it well. And then there are other times where you need to have the independence of an outside investigator, even if you had the knowledge and capacity to do it internally and had the expertise to do it. But there's some reason why you want to make sure that you have that degree of independence that's there. And Holmes fell really in two categories for us. Number one was the resources were pretty intensive, as well as the need to be able to say that this is an independent investigation and to make sure that nobody would think that the university had a motive to conduct an investigation that was internally controlled. So first thing you have to do is decide on what's our motivation for doing it. I think the next question is who's then best equipped to be able to do the investigation. Sometimes that's a law firm. Sometimes it's not. I mean, when we have some employment investigations, sometimes we bring in groups that have expertise in employment and being able to do it. If we have something that involves uniquely medical issues, you might bring in somebody with particular medical expertise. So figuring out who has the right skill set to be able to do it is important, and then making sure that you're matching the expertise with the need. And then sometimes, especially when you're talking with law firms, one of the questions is going to be one of privilege. And right up front, you need to be in a position to be able to identify, are you conducting an investigation and is that investigation going to be privileged? Because there are times when you're going to bring in a law firm to conduct an investigation with no expectation of privilege. We had one that followed up a couple years later where we hired Cozen O'Connor to come and investigate some allegations that our athletics department did not appropriately respond to acts of domestic violence. And that report was a non-privilege report, non-privilege investigation. You really have to get that sorted out on the front end so that when people are going to meet with the folks who are doing the investigation, they're doing it with full knowledge about what the context is of the investigation and how the information is ultimately going to be used. In the context of abuse or misconduct by a member of the staff, did you have concerns about and were there follow-on acts of litigation against the university? There were, and those case was dismissed, but we understood that there was the potential for litigation, but we also understood the need that in that particular case, we weren't dealing with issues of privilege in the same way we have been with some other investigations. And so in the absence of privilege, it really turned into one where questions of transparency and accountability for a public institution were the guiding consideration. And that was important. And ultimately, there were statements that were in the investigative report that became part of what was in the pleadings that were filed in the lawsuit. But you have to look at that in terms of risk. And we accepted the risk that the investigation could disclose information that might be disadvantageous to us, but it was more important for us to be transparent and accountable with our own communities. And just to follow up on, on another topic that came up, the role of media. And you talked about how sometimes it can be a helpful factor, for example, in a trial when they're kind of acting as another juror in the case and you're getting you know feedback on what hits and what doesn't. In terms of conducting investigations, certainly the Holmes matter was a high-profile investigation. Investigation. Did you have a different interplay with the media in that circumstance? You know, any frustrations or difficulties in dealing with that? Or were they helping to 
you know, provide that transparency that the university was trying to achieve? It depends on what you're dealing with. But the general rule that I have is that we're a public institution. We're subject to open record laws. And even if we weren't, we need people to have confidence in what we do. Very rarely do I believe that no comment is a great strategy. Most of the time when people say no comment or that we don't talk about things that are in litigation, that really frames the opportunity for other people to be able to create your dialogue the way they want to. So I really approach the relationship with the media as one where I will talk to them about what we can talk to them about. And when we can't talk to them about something, to be very clear about why we can't. If we have information related to James Holmes that we can't give them because federal law prohibits us from giving it to him, I don't want it just to be a, we can't give it to you. It needs to be, we can't give it to you, and here's why, so that people understand. And to be able to talk about what we can do rather than what we can't do. So if you treat the media as the adversary in that conversation, it tends to reflect poorly on the institution. And we need to be in a place where even if people don't like the answer that we're giving them, that they understand it. I think that makes a lot of sense. And there's uh, one more topic that I think we wanted to touch on if we can take up a little bit more of your time. And that is just your general reflections or advice for legal practitioners that are interested in practicing in the world of academia, perhaps going in-house for a university. And if you have any insights or cautions for people that might want to pursue that type of legal career. So I think the first thing is to recognize that universities, if people are interested in them, are extraordinarily complex type of places. And if you think about it this way, we essentially have within the University of Colorado system, we're one of the state's biggest employers. We have thousands upon thousands of students. We have doctors that are performing millions of procedures in the hospital. We have an athletics department. We essentially operate as a landlord for the people who live in the residence halls. We have police forces. We have student code of conduct. And we have people who are inventing stuff. And so we have to get patents and everything else. What that really means is that we need specific skill sets when we're looking to hire legal counsel to come in-house. We're not looking for a higher education lawyer. Most of the time, we'd be looking for somebody who has employment background because we have a need for people to be handling employment matters. We need to have people who understand export control because we have issues with technology and foreign governments. And so looking for people who have a skill set who are then interested in coming in and working within our community really serves us well. There are very few people, and I'm one of them, I don't have the expertise to be able to say I understand all of higher education law because it reaches so many different places. What I'd be looking for is people who can say I have strong skills within a particular area and have those translate into the higher education community. And do you feel at all like as you've progressed up in your career, you know, now acting as a chief operating officer, that you yourself have become more of a generalist, more of a jack of all trades as you've ascended in your career? Or how has your trajectory changed your practice? I was kind of a jack of all trades in private practice where, you know, there are some people who in my law firm, all they did was construction litigation or all they did was medical malpractice. I always had a pretty varied litigation practice which was helpful coming in because you weren't just thinking about a type of litigation. I think that then when I got into being within the university, you get exposed to all of the different areas. And I think that when you get to the point where you are in a GC type of role, I've had lots of people on my staff who were really, really deep subject matter experts in particular areas. I was less of a deep subject matter expert than I was in being able to recognize here's an issue that we have, be able to bring the right people around the table to be able to talk about it and trying to figure out where it fit within the overall legal landscape. And I think that's really a GC type of skill, which is 
You have to trust the people who have the deep subject matter expertise to make sure you know what you need to know. And then your ability as GC is to be able to project and say, okay, How does this decision affect the broader interests of the institution? And you talked about having the right people at the table. And I think these days that conversation often involves a diversity and inclusiveness aspect as well. And I know that you previously served as the chair for the board for the Center for Legal Inclusiveness and your work there focused on diversity and inclusiveness efforts. And just wondering if you've seen anything, any programs or practices in the legal field that you found particularly noteworthy noteworthy or thought, you know, had good traction? Yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, if you look at the legal profession overall, it hasn't been as diverse and it hasn't been as inclusive as many other professions have been. I think the overall message there is if I was and have talked to law firms, it really needs to be less of a numbers game where somebody says, look, we hired a female attorney or we hired a diverse attorney and feeling like that we've accomplished the goal. What it really is about is how do we make our workplaces better, more equitable, more inclusive, the type of places where people want to stay, where people say, I have a fair opportunity to be able to advance and make partner and have significant relationship with clients. And that's less of a conversation about what you do around hiring than it is about what you do about your culture and making sure that people have real opportunities. And so it should be less of a discussion about who do we hire and more of a conversation that really needs to involve the firm's senior leadership in what type of place are we trying to create. Fascinating insights, Pat. I want to thank you on behalf of ourselves and our listeners for taking the time today to talk with us and also want to thank you for everything you have done and continue to do on behalf of this great Colorado institution. So thanks, Pat, and have a great day. Thanks. I super appreciate it. This concludes this episode of White Collar Briefly. Please visit whitecollarbriefly.com where you can subscribe to our blog and find additional updates on current white collar and compliance topics. White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini pod, copyright 2020 by Perkins Coie LLP. Thank you for listening.